going through the process of setting up and installing uh, Swift. So this will be echoey. Um, uh, this will be just the process of by hand, going through the process, bringing down the code, doing the ring building, pushing the rings out, all of the steps involved with setting up and getting Swift running. And it's a great place for, for us to start. Um, the next session, which will start in an hour, another hour or so. The next one after this. The next one after this. So it'll be a 10 minute break. And then we'll do another one where we're going to do, uh, we'll do a Swift install with uh, the Swift stack platform and go, th and go through the automation uh, processes. Um, it will be a little bit shorter workshop uh, than this first one here. So what we've done, when we first started doing this, we, we brought in ISOs and we distributed USB keys around and everyone got one and, and oh my gosh, it was, it, was, it was tough. But we had to do it because we couldn't have internet. Fortunately, like the OpenStack uh, uh, conferences and the summits have been so good on internet that we're like, well, Let's do something over the network. And we have way more people, and it's a pain in the butt to manage USB keys. So we spun up a bunch of stuff on Rackspace for us just to log in and, and, and do the configuration on. So that's what we're going to be using as a baseline uh, image here. Can I get the volume turned down a little bit, please? It's the gain. Thank you. I don't know this stuff. Hey, Martin, do we have the presentation up? Okay. Yeah. Well. Um, so what we have on the so everyone the first step here is to we're going to log in to each one of those nodes. We don't. I mean, we're going to show what we're going to do here is we're going to show a presentation of the concepts, the slideware, if you will, and then Martin will be driving uh, what we're going to be typing in the in, on the command line on our instances. So really, the first step here is to log into the instance that we have up and running in the cloud, and you know, get a command pop prompt like uh, like Martin has right here. So who does does everyone who have want want one have one of the handouts with the the login information on it? And I see some people are already going to, because we have a handout, people are just going to run ahead and just do everything all at once. <laughs> um, I'll, let me introduce myself uh, quick, uh, quickly and the folks in the room. So I'm, I'm Joe Arnold, uh, 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 CEO of SwiftStack. And uh, that's John Dickinson, the Swift project technical lead, um, uh, also at SwiftStack. Uh, we have Martin helps out with our engagements, and we have um, Clay here who's going to be walking around to, if you have any questions along the way about Swift or Swift Stack, Mar uh, uh, Hugo in the back with the paper, he's another person you can ask questions during the, uh, during the course of this workshop here too. You ejected it before turning. So yeah, yeah, exactly what Clay said. If there's this this workshop is for, and if you have a question while we're going through this, because we're going to talk about some of the core Swift con, uh, constructs, don't hesitate to ask. We're here for answering questions. This is a workshop, not a not a not a lecture series here. Okay. Right. So the philosophy of the lab, we're going we're going to do step by step not with a magical deployment tool. That's in the next workshop. Um, and we're gonna just gonna go through the key concepts as we start typing things along here. So the steps, we're gonna log into the node. We're gonna go through and format devices. We're gonna go mount the drives, create the partitions, build the rings, start up Swift, and then we're gonna upload something to it. So that's what we're gonna do in the next 40 minutes here. This is the first step, log in. So has everyone done this by now? I know we've been kind of stalling around. Anybody? 
Anybody need some help logging in? It's not working for them? Because we could have missed something in our automated provisioning scripts to get everything set up pro properly. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to format the devices on the node itself. We're going to be using XFS to format the device. Hey, John, do you want to say why we're using XFS? Because it rocks. <laughs> now, uh, we, uh, in Swift, we generally recommend that people use XFS because in a lot of testing and uh, large-scale deployments, it happens to be exceptionally good uh, for failure handling and also handling very large numbers of inodes. And uh, it's quite performant as, you're, as it gets uh, more and more data stored in it. So that's why they do that. Um, now, when we format this, there are some uh, options that we pass into the format commands to make the file system. A couple of those that I wanted to point out that are very important are uh, one, looking at the, the inode size. I uh, generally recommend uh, uh, using 512 uh, byte inodes. And uh, this is where all of the metadata for your objects is stored. Uh, so it means that um, the uh, Inode size of 512 is a nice balance between being able to uh, have enough space to store metadata, um, most of your metadata without having to go into new extents on the disk, um, so you get uh, a lower overhead. Um, and then the next, the, the most important thing here that we're talking about is uh, mounting it by label. And this is uh, just a very good best practice uh, in order that when your system reboots for any reason or something like that, you're not going to uh, get your drives mounted in a different order, remap to a different uh, mount point. And so by uh, formatting them and uh, mounting them, or creating the, FS the, creating the file system and then mounting them by label uh, becomes very uh, important. Not that we have any like practical experience with nodes rebooting and having the entire node show up and we don't know where any of the data is. Yeah, yeah, question. No, that is something that you, uh, it's just a uh, rule of thumb. It's, it's a pretty good, uh, for, for out, almost all deployments, as far as a good size that you would, you would use, whether or not you're using 512, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, whether you're not using 2T disks or 4T disks, it's, it's still just a good thing. Uh, yeah. The reason is this is where uh, not only storing the, um, the information like directories and things like that, but the actual object metadata is, ends up storing in the inodes because it's stored in the extended attributes. So you could probably construct a situation where if you had a metadata intense workload, you might want to bump that number up. And I, I think even with some of the original, you're, it'll just uh, do another extent. If, if you overflow this, it'll go to another extent, which is just not great, but it's, it still works. Okay. And Martin's really far. Um, so just just a note. So we had um, um, oh slash dead. Th in front of thank the back you, on thank the you. So we had a uh, so because we booted this these environments on Rackspace for such a large group, we created a bunch of block devices, and then they got mad at us because with they, <laughs> they're like, why do you need six hundred block devices? <laughs> and we got a call from them. So we, at the last minute, we had to change both the slides and try to change the, the slides in the handout. So Martin was up all night um, straightening this out. Um, so so did, what we did, yeah. So it, it, it's using uh, LVA right now, or I'm sorry, LVM. And so uh, you need to put a dev in front of the mapper. The slide uh, got a little typo in it, and it's slightly different than what's on your on your handout there. Uh, so when you're making these uh, slash dev slash mapper v x v d d through f. Right, again, so change that. Here, I'm going to, I'll change it on here right now. There we go. So it should look like this. So apologies for the handout. We had to make the adjustments at one o'clock last night. But this is what this is what the command should look like, right here. Is, is there a reason you don't put any additional 
the, qu the question is, is there a reason we're not doing partitions but using the whole drive? Joe? Why have a partition? You know, it's, we're, when we're building out these systems, we're not really, we're not running an operating system or needs swap space. We're consuming this whole drive into the system, and that's our failure domain, and that's what gets mapped into the ring. And so we don't really feel the need to chop that up into um, more bits. So that's a good observation. Um, and we just format direct the, the, the device directly. And that's, that's a practice that we recommend. And you don't do LDS because you don't need to expand the drive to the rest of the drive. You add more drives. And another thing to note, we're not going to be using RAID here. So when you're provisioning, when you're getting equipment, the drives are exposed in a JBOD mode. They're not rated together. Um, and so if you, if you do have some existing equipment at home and or at work, and you want to try, uh, try this and it has a RAID card, just create you know, one volume per drive um, as a, if you're, if you're going to be testing this out. Um, but if you're buying equipment for, for, uh, for deployment, then there's some hardware configurations that you know, we recommend, which um, yes. where you just have an HBA, not a RAID card, and you, you expose a disk per, per volume. And then that's what you format here. Yeah. Correct. Uh, so y there, there is an, there's some features that are included on RAID, which are can be beneficial, but you don't, you won't use the RAID functionality. So there's a, there's a cost trade-off there. There's a cost trade-off. Um, so then, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to place create a place for these uh, formatted devices to be mounted and. So the steps here is to, we're just going to make places to mount each one of those. So make dir dash p, so, so it builds the full path. And then we're going to do, we're going to mount by the label for each one of those devices that we just created. So we just ran out. If there's anyone not participating but has a handout with a sticker, let us know so we can give it to someone who, act, who may want to use it. So that would be great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, if you're not, you didn't do it. Okay. Uh, we may have a blank handout. I don't know. Hey, Hugo, do we have any blank handouts that some folks may want to take home? We should. Yeah. <laughs> no, this really does happen. The labeling is really important. Uh, yeah, question. I don't know. Do we have any blanks? I don't think we have any more blanks. We're, no, we're out of blanks. This is what we have. Yeah, so, yeah, so just, just to reiterate, the, the, the purpose of, of labeling the disk is so that when, when a system reboots, sometimes SDB, SDC, those will get jumbled around, or if you, if you, if you have a failure in particular uh, and you're, you're removing that drive, you're putting a new one in, or you're replacing a controller, you're adding a different back, uh, um, ex uh, expander card, the operating, the Linux is, will, uh, will often jumble those around. And so we label the devices so that we know who they are in a reboot situation, in, in a reboot situation, and we can go then and take that di take that drive and mount it in the same location. And so, if we did that in uh, FS tab, uh, first off, another thing uh, we have we'll have we have a book which goes through this as well. So as soon as this workshop is over, we'll if you haven't gotten a copy of the book already, but one of the things is don't do that in FS tab because in a in a dense storage system, you'll see a lot of failures, and you don't want to halt the boot process due to a bad disk. And so we recommend having something that happens after the operating system has been booted to, uh, to mount, and then do that mounting based on uh, the label. We're not going to go. We're not going to do that in this 40-minute workshop, but it's covered in the in the installing Swift part part of the, part of the book. Huh? Time. Okay. So next thing, we're going to change the ownership of the, of the file system so that it's owned by the Swift user. Uh, yes, I'll start talking now.
<laughs> okay, so when you get started on these things, uh, we have already installed uh, on that uh, on that server the thank you um, all of these Swift. Um, is it, I don't know. See my anyway. We've already installed all of the uh, Swift handouts so that it uh, Swift handouts, dependencies all the Swift dependencies. Thank you. Uh, and so that you don't have to worry about grabbing the code right now and, and going through just a package install. So we've already done that for you, and we've already put uh, some configs in place that are just a nice default configuration just in the element of time for this workshop. So the next step is we're going to create the ring builder files. The ring builder files are what allow uh, you to uh, describe your cluster. And these are what are uh, created and managed um, Offline, generally from your cluster, you, you generally can do this not on your live cluster. And um, you create a new ring for each of the different kind of uh, things that are stored in Swift. So you've got uh, accounts, containers, and objects. And each of these uh, three then are described by a, um, a single ring. Now, these, uh, these rings can actually have all of the same drives uh, assigned to them, which is exactly what we're going to do here today. So what we're going to do is create uh, the account, the container, and the, and the object rings. And we're going to uh, assign, uh, we're going to put all three of our, uh, the file systems that we just uh, did inside of those. Now the ring builder command file here, I want to describe a couple of, uh, couple of points on it. Um, the first thing is, well, obviously we have the, um, the, the CLI command, and then uh, describing the, the type of uh, builder file we're creating. Uh, giving it the create option. There's others, of course, to add in. We'll see those in just a moment to add in things. Uh, but the, the magic numbers here, 14, 3, and 1. Um, as we go, uh, as, as you create your ring, you need to create this based on, are we, do we have yeah, some no, let me. Yeah, no, I'm going to go through the, let me go through the next slides, because okay. we have a talk on each one of these, or a slide on each one of these. So the first thing is, how big are you going to be when you grow up? So this is called the partition power. And this is a scary thing for most people to set because it's a, something you have to decide before you do the deployment of, this, of the Swift cluster. We recommend setting it to a large number. And what this sets is in Swift, there's a partition space. And that partition space gets distributed across all of the disks in the system. You want enough disks so that you avoid having any hot spots, um, but not so many that uh, there's too many and there, it's, there's more processing than needed to find out where the partition is. So we have a rule of thumb, which is based on how much space you have available in your data center and how many spindles you'll be able to fit inside of your data center physically. It's a calculatable number, and this is how we recommend setting it, which is the number of drives that you'll think you'll have, um, and because it's a partition power, then carry it up to the next power of two. Um, a good setting that we recommend is 18, which will carry up a cluster to pretty good, decent size. Uh, and in the workshop, we're going to recommend something setting it smaller so that it doesn't take very long to build the rings, because it's uh, computationally intensive. And just to go through the math in uh, very, uh, very explicit detail here, let's just assume hypothetically that your cluster was only going to be have, uh, only going to have four JBuds on it, each of which only had uh, 24 spindles inside of it, so a total of 96 drives. So your appropriate partition power there, you knew this was the maximum size that you're ever possibly going to grow your cluster. So in that case, we know we have 96 drives total, and uh, we want 100 partitions on those at scale, so when we're, when we're all grown up. So we multiply 96 times 100 to get 9,600. Now we need to look for the next largest power of 2 that is uh, at least 9,600. And in this case, and this is the example we're using here in the workshop, we're using 14 because 2 to the 14th is uh, just, just right size. Down, yeah. So that's that setting. The next one is how many replicas do we want to have in the cluster? Now this is changeable over the, the, the life of the cluster. So you can actually change it incrementally. You can go from 3 to 3.1. Anyway, we recommend setting it to three, and that's been tested. Uh, and the failure under the, how how the system behaves under failures with three replicas is very well understood and very well tested. We know some uh, there are some deployments that are running with two. 
uh, with some success, and we're working on when you with a larger uh, distributed cluster to ha to go up to four replicas, uh, where you have two in two replicas in each each side. Minpart hours, do you want to do that one? And then finally, the last magic number, if you remember the Swift Ring uh, Builder command, had the 14, 3, 1. 14 for the partition power, 3 for the replica count. And then that 1 is something we call minpart hours. It's a nice little you know, programmer variable name uh, that is the minimum uh, number of hours that must elapse before the, uh, that Swift Ring Builder command line tool will allow you to do another rebalance. And this is something that will help protect you so that um, when you are doing a rebalance command, so you, you add all your new drives uh, in there. You, as you're growing, you're adding more drives. As you're uh, replacing things, you're taking, taking old drives out. And each time you do that, you want to rebalance your data so that, uh, rebalance your ring so that the data is effectively uh, smoothly spread throughout all of it. So when we do that, when we do a rebalance command, Swift will make sure that it locks down at least uh, two copies of your three replicas. Uh, so that you can always still remain available even while you're in the process of deploying your rebalanced ring. And so you set this number generally based on the uh, amount of time it takes for your cluster to undergo a replication cycle. How long does it take to ensure that all of the data is in the right place? So you can watch, there's a, a, an item in the log that comes, will come across. It'll say, okay, finish replication check. And you can watch all of that data point on all of your clusters to know how long it takes for a full replication si cycle to occur for your cluster. And then you take that number and use that and put that in the ring builder so it knows, hey, I know how quickly or how aggressive I can move um, data around when I'm rebalancing, adding new capacity and the like. One implication of this, uh, of this setting is that um, it means that in order to ensure your data is available, uh, it may take more than one rebuild, uh, rebalance cycle to completely smooth out your data. You can see this very easily if you're adding a significant percentage of, uh, of capacity to your cluster all at once. Uh, you may need to do a rebalance, let it all settle out, then rebalance again, and, and continue until it's, it's really done. And that, that command line tool, as you play with it, has a lot of uh, good feedback on um, what the current status of your ring is and how, how well it's working. The next thing is to add the devices. And uh, we're ever lazy, so there's a little shell script for you to add each of the devices into the ring builder. So the ring builder is a database. You're putting the information about each device into that database with Swift ring builder add. And you're adding in for each of the account, container, and object ring files. And one of the uh, one of the other interesting uh, one of the other important parts about when we're doing the Swift Ring Builder to add this um, is this number at the end 100. This number is the weight of the of the uh, storage volume that you are adding into the cluster, and the weight is a uh, dimensionless number, but it only makes sense okay. in comparison to the others. So if something has a weight of 100, it means it's going to have twice as many objects generally as uh, as something that has a weight of 50. Uh, I heard uh, Clay said, um, so we add a new feature in Swift, which is around regions, okay? And so when we add, when we say add, we did not add the region, regionality. It'll default to a single region. So it doesn't break any existing scripts, but it'll say, hey, we have this new region feature, we're gonna just default it to one. So you guys should have gotten a warning about that. Um, the, other, the other zone of, uh, that to, to talk about is, is, is zones. So in Swift, data is going to be distributed, as we say, as unique as possible across a disk, a node, a zone, and region. And so zones are for unique fault-tolerant domains. So if you truly have a data, when you're doing your build, and that group of equipment is either on different power or different network segment, or data center room, then that is what you would anoint as a zone. And in most deployments that are under a petabyte, 
most of the time you'll be running with a single zone. And data will be distributed across uh, the nodes just fine. But it's when you start breaking out of that uh, one to two rack, that's when we start, start using zones. Yeah. Say that. So the lists are, it's a drive, nodes, zones, and regions. So if you have one box, which is what we have here, and you have three drives, we're all gonna, we can be all in the same zone, and data is going to be placed as unique as possible. So that's, we only have one node to work with, but we have three drives, so we're going to put replicas across all three drives. If we had two boxes, two replicas would go on one, one would go on the other, and kind of randomly, uh, two on one, one on the other, vice versa. And as you add, add more devices, and you have, start having a fault tolerant or a, a, a failure domain, then you can say, this is a zone, and then once you create, an, if you create another group of machines that are connected via, you know, that are somewhere else, then you can call that an, another zone. Yeah? So in this exercise, we set up three zones, and we put each drive in its own zone. Yeah. Uh, in in you the real world, uh, what, would, what would be the long-term consequences of kind of making that, that kind of mistake early on? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, in this exercise, maybe what we should have done is had everything is in one zone one, um, and that would probably have been more illustrative of how we should proceed. The, the, the danger is, um, is that you'll, if you don't truly represent your failure domains correctly, you run the risk of having replicas exist in that, in that, in that, in that failure, those failure domains that are actually close. So if you have 20, 20 zones, and then there are three different rooms, you could set up a situation where all the replicas of a particular object happen to sit in one room if you partition the, the, the zones uh, too fine-grained. That's the risk that you run. So don't run a tremendous amount of zones. Only use zones where it truly represents a, a failure domain. No, we, uh, we just did with the, uh, that ring builder command. Uh, if you go back, oh. Oh, wait, which one? Next, next slide. This one. This one. So that mount now uh, mount point is see the very end the D dollar sign I. That's the disk label that uh, we set up earlier. Correct, because earlier we mounted in as you know D one was label one, so it just kind of is a nice one to one. But ultimately, this is the mount point of of that volume. So this is a nice step to do to validate the rings. If you run this command, you'll see, take a look, and you'll be able to see, here's all of the devices that are, have been registered with the builder file. And Martin would have showed the output, but apparently- Martin's having... catching up right now, he had to- Okay, good. To... Yeah. How much you use regions? You use regions when you have data centers, which are, there's a, Latency, latency sensitivity between them. And between two different regions, Swift have, has different rules on how, how data traverses that, that WAN link. And so when a write occurs, the write will occur durably in one of the regions and then be asynchronously replicated to the other. And when a read happens, the a request into one region will prefer data uh, in that region and not go over the WAN link to try to retrieve it. So that's, that's when you'd use, uh, use regions. So far as examples, we've done, you know, account bin container, bin object with yeah. any particular uh, necessity, but we didn't do things in that order. It's, <laughs> yeah, so, no, it, it doesn't matter. The, so the question was, we do account, container, and object. And we've just been doing it in that order. There's really no ordering per se, but the reason why there's three rings is because d data, it's, you want the option to be able to tier out account and container data into different tiers in the system. So for example, we're working with a deployment where we want high performance around account and container. So we've tiered that off into its own infrastructure, running SSDs, 
and then the objects are running on spinning media. So by having separate rings for account and container, that gives us the flexibility to, to tear those two things apart. But for our, for in, our, in our example now and in the, in the next one, we're just gonna be running everything on all the spindles. Rebalance. Oh, Rebalancing, sure. Yeah. So uh, once we have done this, we need to rebalance the ring, just as I described a little bit earlier. Uh, this will assign the partitions to uh, the uh, particular storage volumes. And again, I'm, we keep using the word partitions. Uh, as we talked about earlier, these are not file system partitions, but actually overall pieces of, of the balance of that ring. So the rebalance will make sure that the data is, uh, the partitions are allocated as uniquely as possible across all of your available storage uh, volumes. And uh, in this way, uh, since we have it very simply deployed with just three, uh, three servers, I mean, sorry, three storage volumes, then we are going to have one third of those partitions assigned to each of those devices. So you can run the rebalance command here, and then you can, uh, that will create uh, the serialized version of your ring file, which is then deployed out to your cluster. Because the builder file is actually pretty big. And it's, rebalancing is slow. And rebalancing is slow. You're actually distilling down a, a from a, uh, from a database of all of the devices, when the timing of when each of those devices got introduced into the system, its history of which partitions have existed on that device, and you're distilling that down into a condensed uh, roadmap, if you will, for uh, where all the partitions are supposed to live. And that's, that's what the rebalancing command. You're taking a database and you're distilling it down into um, what is in effect a pickled JSON blob that's going to get loaded in memory by all, this, all the, the, the nodes in the system. So now, once, you, once you're done rebalancing, in our case, uh, you've got the, this, this creates that ring file and uh, puts it in the appropriate place. Happens to be you don't have to deploy this out there because we're all running on a single server. Then you can run that Swift Ring Builder command again uh, with your builder file, and you'll see that there have been partitions assigned. You'll see that the ring balance is now zero, which means it's not over full or under full. It's just right at zero, which is exactly what you want. And uh, we're ready to go. And now it is time to start Swift. So has anybody had any problems getting the uh, up to the ring uh, coordinating yet? If so, raise your hand and Hugo or Clay or Daryl can run over and help you out. I think we're good. OK, so now that you have everything in place, um, we installed Swift for you and set up a sample uh, config file because we're not going to have time to walk through all the config options and things like that. Um, and now that we have created some uh, file systems, we've mounted those on drives, we have uh, ensured that they are in the ring properly, we've got the proper balance on everything, we've deployed our ring file out now to the server, just by virtue of it running in this, in this case. Um, now we are ready to start Swift. And so Swift comes with a Swift init command, a uh, binary uh, uh, tool, uh, CLI tool, that allows you to uh, control the Swift processes. There's lots of different server processes and daemon processes that can run. And so this one that's on the screen right now, the Swift in its main restart, or you could just use start in this particular case, um, will start up the main server processes. This is the proxy server process, the account server process, the container server process, and the object server processes. These four processes will then start up in the background and start listening and responding to connections. And at this point, you have a working Swift cluster, at least from an API perspective, the, um, with an endpoint. Yeah, the the replicators, audit, the the consistency processes don't get started with this command, and we'll walk through that next if we have time. If we have time. <laughs> so you can see what's going on. We've uh, configured also one of the things I left out that we've already configured for you is uh, we've configured uh, uh, our syslog to uh, segment off all of the Swift logs to go into var log swift all dot log. Uh, normally these would be in a kind of default. We use syslog, so unless you have it configured specially, it's going to uh, go into var log syslog. Um, and you can, you can uh, segment off uh, where it goes. Where so it goes in very fine detail. So the next 
the first thing that we're going to do once we have an API system up and running is, is walk through the authentication. So Swift, the mechanism it uses for auth, is to send in requests, a token is generated, then that's returned to the client, and that token is used for subsequent API requests. So we can do this by hand, or manually, if you will, by using curl, and we can see a token being generated from an, from an, from an authentication request to the authentication service of, of Swift that's running. There's a configuration to set that. Um, I think default in the system, it's 24 hours. It, it is dependent upon your auth system that you're using. Yeah. But the one that comes out of the box with Swift, by default, it's 86,400 seconds. And so when you make this request, you're going to get a token. And that's represented by um, X auth storage token. And then you're also going to get a URL. And so as a, as a client, when you're building one, you would do the authentication request, and you would pull out that storage URL, you'd pull out that token, and then you'd use those two items to make your subsequent request. So this is what a request on the account would look like, is you would pull it, you would take that auth token, which is the auth token, and you post to that, you'd get that URL, and it would say, hey, there's no content here because, well, you haven't uploaded anything yet, right? One other thing that I'd like to point out with Swift, uh, I think we're... Nope. No. Nope. Okay, never mind. We're, we're out of time. We're not out of time. We're running short. <laughs> so then the next, the next step would be to upload something. Well, and... <clears throat> if, you know... So what we're going to do next is use the Swift command line. And so what we've done is we've put a, a picture of a cat because, you know, if, if you're not uploading cat pictures on a web addressable storage system, you're, you're doing it wrong. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so, oops. And so we have, there's a Swift command line client. And this allows you to specify the authentication endpoint, your user credentials and then put in upload, download commands so that you can upload something into the system. And so what we're going to say here is swift-u, and then the, a pre-configured account name that we have uh, already on the cluster, uh, dash k, which is the key, the password, admin, and then dash a, which stands for auth URL, and we're going to post that locally on the system. And, and if you had cd'd into the home directory, uh, we'll have a, a, a cat's JPEG that will upload into it. Any questions about this part? Anybody having issues with this part? If the container cat doesn't exist, will it create it? The, will the CLI tool it. automatically yeah. creates the container if it doesn't exist. <laughs> Correct. Millions of files. Yeah. So then if we ask, if we ask the, the cluster again for the listing of all the files, we should get back, hey, the file we just uploaded. Okay, now we're gonna get really fancy. Really fancy. What we're gonna do is we're going to change some of the metadata on that container so that it's globally readable. On the object, I think. Nope, it's on the container, I think it's and on the it's container. setting it's on. it to a publicly readable. Pub anything in that cat's directory, anyone can read. So this is taking advantage of Swift's ACL functionality. And when we do that, so we'll do the post, dash r, reads blat, which is the refer cats. And then what we can do is we can pull up that IP address, and that's going to be the one on the front, the one you SSH'd into, we're running Swift on it, we're running it on port 80, so now we're, we're effectively, we've just stood up a web server that ha it has, a storage, has a storage system underneath, and we're just going to hit that URL, and we should be able to load up our, our cat picture. The 
The minus R. So the description of these, uh, this part here is when you're posting uh, metadata into this container, minus R is a shortcut for uh, read uh, ACLs, and the uh, dot, uh, uh, the dot R colon star is a slightly abbreviated shortcut for um, set any referrer is allowed to have read access to this. Yes. That's the refer. Yeah. And for, so it was point thirty. And so that is the workshop. We have uh, we've covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time. We brought uh, uh, there's a we have a book that we've done on Swift which goes into the uh, more detail into all these steps and in all, into all of these configuration settings, and we'll have that available up front here. We're going to take a, I believe it's a 10 minute break, and we're gonna come back, and we're going to do another install of Swift, because I know you can't get enough ways to set up and install Swift, so we're doing another one. This time we're gonna do it with the uh, Swift Stack platform, uh, and we'll start at Two, I think it's two, uh, two, two twenty, right? Two ten. Well, it's two ten now, but we. I think it's a ten minute break between workshops. Yep. Yep. Two twenty. So we'll come back, and if you have questions about getting this up and running now, where there's a few of us that will walk around and during the during this break, help you get to that last mile, and then come up front, and we'll hand out. Uh, we have more copies of the book. So, thank you.